Hey, Bill Gustin here. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, depends upon where you are. I'm in Miami, Florida, and uh, our topic today is going to be high-rise and mid-rise firefighting, but from a, uh, a less urban point of view, suburbia. Um, a high-rise building does not know whether it is in midtown Manhattan or midtown middle America outside of Chicago. The requirements in terms of equipment, resources, personnel are the same. What's different, radically different, is how we are going to get those resources and how are those resources going to work together. So we've asked a, um, an officer from a, uh, a medium-sized department outside of the Chicago area uh, to, to come on board. And he's going to introduce himself and tell a little bit about where his department was and where it was headed and how improvements were made. And with, I am a big fan of Mabus. That is the Mutual Aid Box Alarm System. I began my firefighting career in Wheaton, Illinois, in the early '70s, and it was just the beginning of Mabus. And I've been a fan of it ever since. So, Chris, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself, take all the time you want, brother, and explain. Oh, and also, I'm going to plug your article. I don't know what, what month it's coming out, but excellent article, very heads up. So go ahead. You got it, Chris. Thank you, Captain. I appreciate being on the on the show with the uh, the big heavy hitters in this this. Uh field. So my name is uh, my name is Chris Rymett. I'm a lieutenant with the Arlington Heights Fire Department, which is uh, about 110 people strong in the northern north uh, northwest part of Cook County, just outside of Chicago. Uh, so we uh, we've had we we've had a pretty good growth boom in the past, you know, 30 years of high rises. We've, we've run out of room to grow laterally. So we've been going up. Uh, we have anywhere from three to 17 stories in our in our jurisdiction and there's a lot of high rises surrounding us so we had uh in our older policy and that they had redone just after i came out of the department right after the uh, the cook county fire in chicago and it addressed a lot of the a lot of the issues that we had uh, about you know searching and you know the importance of searching stairwells and things like that so we didn't have the same issue uh, we had people that were unaccounted for and wound up perishing in the stairwells but uh, where it kind of fell short, it just kind of uh, exact, it elaborated on our existing policy. And so we were still using inch and three quarter hose with fog nozzles and some of the old, old language that was legacy from our policy was still in there. And it didn't take into account uh, how many people really were required to, to operate in one of these. It was still working off of the, you know, we have three people on an engine, three people or three or four people on a truck if we're lucky. And, uh, you know, kind of keeping it to, you know, the lowest possible alarm that we needed. So uh, it actually kind of started this, uh, one of our, one of our uh, newer, newer members went down to the HROC conference uh, in, in Florida and brought a lot of this stuff back. And he, we're talking to him and we started talking to the chief and he was on board. Uh, he gave us a lot of support, which is fantastic. He, he was, uh, which was good because he was one of the people that had been involved in writing the previous policy. Uh, so he was all about expanding it. He and then he said, "You guys, he, we we gave, got the permission to go ahead and you know do whatever we really needed." He gave us our left and rights. Uh, he really wanted to see our a change from inch and three quarter to two and a half inch hose with smooth bore nozzles, which was great. And uh, we had at the current time we had uh, we had like I mentioned we used inch and three quarter hose and we had a hundred feet in this giant bag. Um, we had two lengths in the giant bag and we had two of those. So we had 200 feet of hose and the bags weighed anywhere from 80 to hundred pounds a piece. So they were really cumbersome. And a lot of times when we ever, we had alarms in large buildings, they didn't get used because the fact that they were so cumbersome and it took two or three people to move this thing. So our really goal was to get rid of that, distribute the equipment, make it more user-friendly, use the appropriate size line and the, uh, get the manpower that we needed out there. So that was one of the big things. So our chief gave it, we, we uh, solicited from our department 
for people that were interested in this committee. So we, we, we want a cross section of new, brand new people to the senior most people. They weren't all officers. The, uh, we had firefighter medics, uh, we had two lieutenants, a couple engineers. So we had a, a good cross section of people. And uh, we went out and tested several uh, different hose packs at, for a day or two. And we tested the Denver load. We tested New York City's uh, style. We tested Chicago's. We looked at a bunch of different ones. Uh, we wound up uh, using Chicago's, not just because it was the proximity of where to of where in Cook County and we're close to Chicago, but the load itself was very similar to what we used originally. So we, the the other loads were great; they worked well. Uh, we figured that the the uh, uh, learning curve was much less for this because it was just basically an accordion load that you could drape over your pack. So it was very easy to fix uh, errors if you lay the the threaded uh, the couplings the threaded couplings together next to each other. You could just flip it over and couple them rather than you know, we had some issues with the New York style. If we loaded it wrong uh, and they got crossed crossed and we had knots in the stairwells. Uh, so we went out there, uh, the five of us. We did our research for two days and we all came to a consensus that we figured the Chicago pack was the best. The smoothbore nozzle worked the best, so we did that. Uh, so we started working tactics and, and we were we had read all the books uh read all like the the books from denver the books from new york city all and they all seemed that they were coming out of larger cities where they their staffing was a lot more than ours like, like i had mentioned uh we have an engine company that has three people on it uh we have a truck company that has a minimum of three people on it uh if we have extra personnel they'll go to the truck first so we'll have a four-person truck and then we'll you know, as it goes, we'll go to the engines and uh, step it up. We have a minimum of 25 people a day. Uh, NFPA says you need a minimum of 42 people to go to a high rise fire. So we, we were behind the eight ball already. So we knew that we had to up our up our response to this. So we work like uh, the captain said, we work in a uh, an area of Illinois. We're very fortunate to have a Mavis system, which the mutual aid box alarm system. Uh, for those of you on here that aren't familiar with that, it started in the late 60s uh, for mutual aid. So it started pre-designating who's going to go where and who's going to help each other out, and what resources do you have, and uh, how can we get the uh, equipment dispatched to help each other out in a timely basis, rather than calling people up on phones and saying, hey, can you come with your engine or not? We need this. The, uh, it had everything pre-staged which was great. And it's grown uh, into several states. Uh, it's all through Illinois. There's uh, over a thousand member, uh, members of this, this organization throughout the, the multiple states. And it's really well organized. So the, and it's really defined and it, it's something that is, uh, has been around since I've been in the fire service. And it really has become the, the lifeblood of mutual aid. So we knew that we had the resources. We just need to figure out how to get them there. So we had like my agency. We uh, would get uh, on a, a, a possible structure fire. We would get uh, three engines. Uh, sorry, four engines or sorry, two engines, a truck, an ambulance squad, and a chief. So we knew we had to up that. So we decided on a, on a confirmed fire. We had a response of four engines, three tr uh, three truck companies. Our squad, now uh, the squad that we have in our department is kind of like the old Johnny and Roy squad. It's a pickup truck with two paramedics on it. Uh, it's not like a large, large company squad. Uh, it's a light duty squad. And we got three ambulances in the chief. So we knew that the reflex time of going from the initial alarm to uh, the raising alarm added added the time to and put us even more behind the eight ball of this fire. So we, uh, if we got an alarm with that somebody had phoned in saying there's smoke in my apartment or there's an actual fire or something. It went, we had it set where it would go to that upper, we would, it would dispatch it as a working structure fire. So, and we had to, we worked with our dispatch agency and we worked with our building department to designate all of the buildings in our town, uh, which we came to about 80, 80 structures within our city limits that fit our, the criteria that we define as a high rise. And as a committee, we, we, you know, uh, you know, uh, we decided that anything five stories or over was going to be designated as a high rise. So we had it set the addresses in our dispatch system, where if one of those addresses came in with a, a smoke or whatever, it would be dispatched as a working structure fire. Uh, from there, 
if we the first company that got on scene would become our fire investigation team. So we set that because we have, you know, we're resource constrained for manpower. Uh, we set it up where it could be an ambulance, it could be a, a like the two person squad, it could be an engine or a truck. Whoever got there first would form the fire investigation team, but they have to have a minimum of two people. So their job would be to get off, to go to the, pan, uh, the fire alarm panel, figure out what's going on and start heading up there and figure out they're traveling light, they're carrying a set of irons and a, a extinguisher. They go up to the floor where the activation is or the, where if there's or if, uh, incidents reported, they relay back to the battalion chief coming in or the other people coming in that, hey, this is just burnt food or we can return everybody or yes, we have something going on. So the uh, from there, once it's confirmed that we have a actual fire, it goes from a just the working fire response. It and then we decided to get a lot more uh, equipment rolling. This is where the Mavis stuff really comes in. So we went right to a second alarm. So it adds several engine companies, several truck companies, more squads, more ambulances, uh, a, more chiefs than you can possibly imagine to start filling out those ICS positions, to start filling out those attack positions, to start filling out those rescue positions. So, and the, uh, we're getting, you know, multiple companies coming at the same time. The, if we get in when the next end, so when the next engine comes, so our first two engines, they form the fire suppression team. So they're the attack team. So they're, they're going to take those bundles that we had and we, took those hoses that weigh 30, like roughly 30 pounds, 30, 30 to 35 pounds a piece. And we can put them over the, the each firefighter's uh, air pack. And the officer has a, the, the hydrant bag, the high, the high rise bag that we found. It, there's a photo of it in the, uh, in my article. It's fantastic. So it has all it's pre it's pre-made the uh, it comes with the, all the equipment. It weighs like 25 pounds. And it's much less light, much less weight than what we had. The stuff that the appliances that we had were all piecemeal together. Uh, stuff left over that we found in the basement that was from the 70s or, you know, it weighed 10 times more than what we have now. So we're going up with two companies married together and everybody's taking up a, hose, a length of hose. And we have the we have the uh, high rise bag, the small little high rise bag that has a shoulder strap. The uh, now. The, the trucks that come in, first truck is going to go, they're going to be doing search. Second truck is going to be going above. And then we have the third truck doing stairwell operations and going to the top floor. The uh, We have, with this uh, increased uh, uh, response, the we're going to have uh, the chiefs coming in. So they're going to be able to relieve the, the company officer and the, uh, to run run the fire suppression operation. So they're free to go back to their, their company. So we're gonna have that oversight. We're gonna have a chief officer running the, the uh, rescue operation so they can coordinate all the truck and re- uh, squad companies doing the searches. We're gonna have a chief officer running the, the medical sector because we have several ambulances coming in because it, it's inevitable that there's gonna be injuries in a real high rise. So it's it's inevitable. So we're gonna have them set up and then we're gonna have our, our on duty battalion chief gets really uh, the way our department works is our on duty battalion chief gets to the scene he starts up command um and then when uh one of our either a chief or a deputy show up to the scene they relieve them they're the uh, overall operational incident commander and then our on duty battalion chief becomes a, like a forward oper- operations which is essentially forward command and runs everything from the inside the reason why we switched uh we have the transition is the uh, it was the we we felt that the uh, on duty battalion chief has the operational knowledge of what's going on. So they just move them forward and then they backfill the logistics job of the incident commander and then they can take over from there. But the uh, so, yeah, the we worked with and when we were fortunate and Jimmy Davis from the city was there, we were fortunate enough to have a building in our town that was vacant at the time. It was a five-story high rise that we were able to drill in this. So we were able to build, actually do this in real time with our companies. Uh, And Jimmy came out, he was great. He came out for a day or two and he really gave a lot of knowledge that he had from what worked and what didn't in Chicago and was able to apply it to our uh, reduced manpower. And we kind of transitioned from the stuff that we read in the books 
to the stuff that we're going to be able to do. So and really kind of backfill what we were saying, uh, how we're getting the extra equipment to fill out these positions. And this is the biggest thing we had to tell our guys that this is not a, uh, a fast exercise. So as this is not a fast evolution that, you know, we had some, some people that were like, yeah, we'll just take the hose off and go run inside and go put the fire out. And they re when we did these evolutions, it was really eye opening for a lot of people that one, we can like, we're a suburban department. We don't use two and a half very often. Uh, one, we, we can move two and a half with re reduced manpower just as efficiently as with the, uh, uh, if we had multiple companies, and two, it's not a it's not a quick quick uh, exercise. So it's going to take a while to get on there. And so going to show these uh, our guys, and they really took to it uh, that they this was a, a long operation. They really liked it, and they I think they got a lot out of it. But yeah, the the selling it to or proposing the uh, the Mavis really leaning on Mavis with our chiefs they really bought into it and they gave us all the support we needed. So I really got to give them kudos uh, for the support we got. And we really came out with a really good policy. Uh, it's pretty comprehensive. I know I kind of, that's in a short, the short story about it. The, uh, like the captain said, I, I, there is an article coming out where I explain this a lot more uh, on all, all the different parts in the, uh, the one last thing I do want to want to say. So as far as uh, it kind of uh, ties into using Mavis and using a lot of mutual aid. So we're getting, the, um, when I talk about the chief officers, we have uh, five, chief, uh, six chief officers on duty that are 40 hour week people in my department. So if we have a fire Monday through Friday between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m., they're all gonna come. But if this is outside of working hours, we're gonna, and we're gonna get several chiefs from outside agencies. So one of the things that I really wanted to do is everybody had around us working within Mavis has similar policies, but they're not all the same. I really wanted to give something to those people coming in from outside agencies. They may be coming from another Mavis division, another department that's several towns away that we've never really worked with before. So uh, they in uh, uh, reference to know what is where we're going from. The uh, where we go, where we're going from, and what what frequencies we use, uh, what your tasks are. So each chief coming in uh, has a reference card that the, they're going to report to command and get their assignment, and then they're going to hand them. It's like if you're say uh, you're the suppression chief, he the the incident commander has a reference card with all of your tasks, all who you report to, who reports to you what your tactical frequencies are, what your operational frequencies are, the uh, what your benchmarks are, and the uh, they have a, uh, a reference card with all the radio call signs for everybody else that they can take. And so they have an idea. This is, okay, this is the channels I need. They know what the, they know who, who's working for them, know who they're working for, and what their, you know, what their parameters are. So everybody's kind of on the same page. So the, okay. uh, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Just want to make a pause here for some shout outs okay first shout out is to this company right here they make beverage containers uh key no they make fire hose and they make great fire hose and i want to say a shout out to uh, mark lighthill and dave hibben who is my hero from dc engine 10 and uh they have different types of hose for different flows if you you're, they've got a hose that is, uh, I can believe it's Combat Sniper, which is happy at around 160 gallons a minute. Then you can move up to the Combat Ready, depending upon what your desired target flow is. Uh, you'll never go wrong with key. We're talking high rise today. You need hose that has uh, an impressive lack of uh, friction loss, and uh, you want great um kink resistance another shout out here is to uh our brother is here is not today because he's busy running the uh uh florence valley fire district and that would be jason hovelman because he is going to be one of the keynoters at fire department instructors conference in april in indianapolis and he is very qualified and deserving to be a keynoter uh, congratulations, uh, Jason, 
And I hope that if uh, this evening you take your lovely wife, Cassie, out to dinner the way that our brother Mike is going to do uh, with his wife, Missy, correct? Missy, yes. All right. And then um, another shout out to two graduates of the Georgia Smoke Diver School, which is not an easy task. Not an easy task for Miami Dade. The slave driver in charge is a David Rhodes. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but um, he's, he's one of these slave drivers, and it is a very, very difficult, rigorous course. Uh, our two people were uh, Eric Vidal, uh, a great firefighter and a great, uh, he competes in the combat challenges, and he's just, he's a physical machine. And all 120 pounds of her, Laura Rojas, who has her heart and her head in the job. And what I've seen over the years is that uh, the ladies that have the Corazon, Jimmy, the desire, and now that they're being held to the same standard. So congratulations, Laura. Uh, now grow your hair out and uh, you, you don't have to wear that baseball cap all the time. Uh, let me see. Oh, yeah. Uh, Billy Goldfeder. Um, indirectly, Billy Goldfeder. The other BG. Uh, I strongly recommend that everyone in our audience today, including our panel, either go to the secret list or go to YouTube and go to the Matt Letourneau documentary, Fire Rescue Education. It is about the passing of a stellar firefighter in Philadelphia, but it is far more than just a examination of his death. It goes into so many wind-driven fires, basements, water supply, frozen hydrants. It will be an hour and a half. That's how long it takes. Very well spent. So kudos to the Philadelphia Fire Department. Uh, for the production of that very, very valuable documentary. Valuable to everybody, not just on Philadelphia, but valuable to everybody. It is definitely worth seeing. Let me see if I left anybody out here. Mike Reagan, retired from the Fairfax County Fire Department. God bless you, Mike. You and I went to a horrible earthquake in Armenia in that was in the former Soviet Union in 1988. And I lost all of my memorabilia in Hurricane Andrew in 1992. And God bless Mike. And Mike has uh, sent me a lot of pictures that I have not seen in a long, long time. So, Mike, I told you I would, uh, I would give you a, a shout out. And uh, I really thank you. Um, Chris, I have a feeling that there are probably 100 officers out there that are in the same boat. Their department is in the same boat that yours is. And um, would you be available to um, have these people contact you if uh, if they so desire? Absolutely. So the uh, at the end of the article, I put my email address. Uh, I can share it again uh, on here if you'd like. The, All right, uh, Chris, let's don't reinvent the wheel, man. You know, you've already done a lot of heavy lifting here, man. Listen, be listen. I made a career out of shamelessly plagiarizing people. Okay, <laughs> we talk about a high rise plan. I chick, I, I completely picked Clark County, City of Chicago, FDNY, and Northern Virginia, uh, Fairfax County, up in that area. Pick the clean. I'm not going to have to make up this stuff myself. <laughs> so uh, while we're on high rise, uh, we've asked our friend Jack, Jack Murphy, uh, to tell us a little bit about uh, the program. And then, Jack, we're going to have to talk about this Grenville Tower thing because you got my blood boiling now, brother. Go, go ahead, Jack. All right. Thank you. First of all, uh, Chris, you know, I wish you a lot of luck with what you're doing. You, you, you're making a, a lot of things happen. Uh, a lot of things moving, moving parts there. And one of the things in the high rise book, Tracy and I talk about small towns, tall buildings. So we'll have a conversation down the road in the FDIC this year. 
uh, we, uh, how do I say, joined forces with the UK, United Kingdom. They run a high-rise international program over there. And our good friend Brent Brooks uh, went over there to lecture a year or two ago. So we saw a need for this in the collaboration with the FDIC. So we're running it for three days uh, during the workshops and everything. Uh, the, t the topic is all obviously on high rises, but it's more than the fire service. We have architects, engineers, we have uh, appliance people. So I'll just give you a few uh, keynote people that are talking. Uh, Frank Lieb, obviously, he's going to he's going to be a keynote uh, and a monitor. He'll be talking about the Bronx fire in, uh, in 2022. I'll be talking about if these walls could talk about building intelligence and you need this going forward with all these buildings. Uh, we have a person coming in uh, talking about the flammable modern facades, the Grenfells out there. And what do we have in the United States? Uh, just on the topic we're talking about today, there'll be an individual coming from uh, Europe talking about tall buildings when they come to your town. Uh, Jerry Tracy, the good brother Jerry, will be talking about vacant buildings, vacant high-rise buildings during this crisis of COVID going from office now to mix occupancies. Uh, another thing is pressurization in stairwells. Uh, we'll end up the day and have a forum on Grenfell on, on the Monday. Tuesday, we'll open up, and this runs from 8 in the morning to 8.45 in the morning to 5. Uh, the U.S. Fire Administrator, Dr. Merrill, will be talking. Another gentleman will be talking about high-rise firefighting in a war zone. So someone from Ukraine, I believe, is going to be talking about that. Uh, fire stopping in buildings. You know, we need balanced fire protection. You can't keep giving things up, trading everything for sprinklers. So you have that balance approach there. Uh, talking about facade testing, a good friend up in Ottawa, uh, Pete McBride coming down, who has seen the wind. So trying to pick up a little bit more on that again. A crisis uh, or emergencies that's, that have combustible cladding. Again, a lot of this stuff on cladding. Uh, and another thing coming our way, I don't know if you've seen them out there, but fire hazards on green walls and high rises. Now you see this vegetation going all the way up the building now. <laughs> and I'm saying, who's sprinkling that? Uh, Russ Timpson, again, uh, he's one of the gentlemen leading this out of the, out of the uh, eighth international. He'll be talking about the need for two staircases in high rise buildings. Brother Davis will be talking about when buildings fail us, lessons learned. So he'll be talking about a high-rise fire there. I, Jim, I believe, is where the firefighter died in the stairwell from a heart attack. Uh, Anthony Karos uh, uh, coming out with a book on uh, on command. He'll be talking about common chaos at, in high-rise fires. Uh, going down to the third day, I'll go over it real quick. Uh, we have uh, another thing to... Jerry Mann coming up from Australia, talking about tactical decisions and high-rise firefighting. And our good friend, uh, Brent Brooks, who will be talking about practical to tactical enhancing high-rise fires. And we'll have another one out there too, Walter Pigeon. Uh, Walter will be talking about tablet command. And how do we get all this, is building information and the fire ground uh, things that are going on there and make it work for you once this becomes a larger event. So I think, in essence, we, we're covering everything from soup to nuts on high rises the first time. Uh, so we're moving forward with this. We're, we're asking people uh, on the website here to, to, to uh, sign up. There's a break for firefighters right now. Uh, once you go on the website for tall buildings on the FDIC, the code in capital letters is tall firefighter. That's the code, and that will give you a, a massive reduction in cost to get into this program. So I, I, I encourage everyone out there on the fire service in all venues, large metro to small towns, uh, to take advantage of this. And uh, it's only the beginning. We, we're hoping to extend this you know, down the road too. So any questions on that, gentlemen? Sounds Jack, great. Jack, what a great conference. What a great conference. I've got to be teaching my own classes that is always going to be a problem with fdic yeah is it you know i know they don't want to offer a class twice but you know i'm going to attend mike dugan's class uh well then it's at the expense of wanting to attend like four other classes but 
I got to pick and pick and choose, you oh, know, yeah. to, the, to the expense of the other ones. That's that's the beauty of the FDIC. It's difficult getting around, you know. So yeah. oh, got and, it. And the idea is that some of the instructors, yeah. like Brent and, and Lee and everybody, some who's in workshops outside, so we're moving them around tactically to get in here to do that. And and the thing this year, first time around, I have a an extended list of a lot of these guys sitting here to come in and talk later. So at a different time, so uh, it's it's going to be a challenge. I, I always look forward to challenges. So uh, I like how you have reached out to other disciplines. Uh, Chris was talking about reaching out to his building department. When you're dealing with high rise buildings, man. You know, it, it, like we got buildings that are loaded with old people. Yeah, you yeah. know, we're looking at transit for relocation. Uh, where are we going to house these people? Um, it gets into a lot of interrelated type disciplines. You can't just stay in amongst yourself and the fire service. You got to reach out. And I, I'm really glad for this. Jack, there's one other thing. Uh, yeah, okay. We want two stairways in a high rise building, we want two stairways in any multi story building. Um, you mentioned Grenfell Tower. Yeah. And I was infuriated to see the London Fire Brigade being put on trial uh, for their actions or inactions, whether the shelter in place strategy was effective or not or appropriate. I don't know. But what I saw conspicuously absent was I don't see any building code official, contractor, or developer on trial for having a high-rise building, a multi multi-family building with only one friggin' stairway. How about that? Yeah. Why wasn't that guy on trial? Yes, and they're they're still in litigation over this thing. You know, I, I, I res totally respect the Grimwoods of the world trying to uh, rewrite this stuff and everything. The, the thing is that you know, I was surprised. I've been in London. I just didn't think they would have had one stairwell. In you know, and now there's a move in the United States a little bit, you know, the industry is now professing up to eight stories. So the thing here is that once that gets started, it, it has a life of its own. Now, if I deal with one staircase, they they also took away another standpipe from me. So I have one staircase for a fire attack like they did in Britain and, and for evacuation. And that don't work. Plus some of these stairs, the scissor stairs too. So we're trying to raise the level with the fire departments locally. You got to get involved here to head all this stuff off. It, 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 the industry is always looking for selling square footage. And we have to trade off everything for their square footage. So the idea here is that, and I always profess this, is a balanced approach. I am, for me personally, I am not giving up anything on the balanced approach on the passive side anymore. That's it. That's me. I'm, I've had it. You know, I, I live in a ground scraper here, guys. It, it, it's 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 an old mill. It's 700 feet long. Not one fire door in the car. <laughs> wow. How's that? Wait, it's wait, Jack, the hallways it's, are 700 feet long? Yes. With no smoke barrier doors? No. But Holy shit, it's sprinkling. It is sprinkling. Yes. It's only and three stories. Is it a... Long. True mill with with uh, yes. no concealed spaces. No, no, no concealed spaces on the mill side until you get to the roof where they put a, a fourth story up with coal form steel. The whole thing. So you have a hybrid drill building. All right. So these are ground scrapers. We talk about this in the high rise book. You know. And then how do you figure out your hose legs? There's seven staircases. Only one staircase goes directly outside. Everything drops into the building. So you need to rethink this stuff. Jack. You know, with the mid-rise stuff. Go ahead. Um, what what city are you living in? What what fire department protects you? Uh, Warren, Rhode Island. Warren, Rhode Island. Yeah. All right. Have they a silly question? Have they been in the building? Has anyone oh, yeah. been in there? And, and I'm yeah. sure they have with you living in there, right? They, they, I got on the tour already. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right now for them, I'm breaking down the building intelligence for them where everything is, how it lays out, what to look for, uh, and things of that nature. So, and I'll be talking about this uh, at the Fools Convention in New England with Dugan 
uh, repurposing uh, old buildings and lightweight construction buildings side by side. You know, what are the different tactics for each? Yeah, Mike, Mike and I. Uh, here's, here's the book, by the way, guys. You, nice. Uh, let's see. Turn it this way. Other way. Other way. Other way. Other way. Other way. Yeah, 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 other way. All right. That's Show me the, the bodies, how we let Grenfell right. happen. Yeah. And one of the quotes in here that, that it said is that every time the industry and the third party government people, representative government, talked about this, this one individual from the government said, Show me the bodies. That was his comment back for not taking care of what they knew was an issue. So if you're in the fire service business dealing with these tall buildings, this is a must read. Thank you, Bill. Uh, all right. Well, thank you, Jack. Thank you for coming I'm, on. I'm going to agree with Jack Murphy on that too. I read that book and it is way more than just a firefighter book. Mm -hmm. It is a window into how governments operate, how governments deal with contractors, new products. Um, and it's, it's amazing. It goes through step-by-step step how that London government allowed that flammable combustible material to be put on that building. It, and it goes through. It, and it wasn't just the London Fire Department were, were in the brigade was fighting for it. It, it. Again, voice is not heard. You know, they were fighting for these type of things. It's just a matter of how it gets into the political hands of things. So, I, you know, I, I highly praise everyone in that London Fire Department trying to do what they had to do that day. It, it's just, you know, like and now we're faced with every, you know, the shelter in place becomes a problem for us now in some of these buildings. And, and after 9 11, we came up with tips in New York. Total building evacuation, in building reloca relocation, P for partial evacuation, S for shelter in place. So you have to have all these, all these type of evacuations. And when do you apply for plan A, B, or C? So things change rapidly in these buildings. Everybody knows that. So it's. Captain Mike, I know you've got a, uh, a date. And uh, I did want to ask you one thing. Um, we were, of course, we communicate all the time. Uh, you attended a, uh, a rather great reunion at your company. And can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, how way back did you get veterans to attend? Uh, to the 70s. Wow. Uh, my old fire company, where I was a fireman, ladder 43. Every Super Bowl Sunday has an old timers breakfast and they invite all the old guys in and the young guys make breakfast and all the young guys in the firehouse show up and they cook and all. And the guys come in, uh, a couple of my captains were there. Uh, there were guys that I worked with in the eighties there. And, you know, guys who started way before me with the senior men when I was there. And it was just, it was a great thing. And I think it's a great tradition and it, Everybody knows when Super Bowl Sunday is. So every Super Bowl Sunday, you go to the firehouse at 8 o'clock. It's breakfast. You get in there. You see guys you haven't seen. In a, a, you know, some of them you haven't seen in a whole year. But it's so great to get together. And it, it's, what a fabulous tradition. And, you know, breakfast is done by 10, 30, 11. You're on your way home. You're home by noon to be with your family. And you can do whatever you got to do on Super Bowl Sunday. And it's just a, it's a really well thought out plan. And we also had to get together for all the old timers on because it was 53 engine and 43 truck. And on 5-3, May 3rd, every May 3rd, we have a reunion where I was the captain. Uh, 123 truck, January 23rd, unfortunately, which is a um, it's the, the date of Black Sunday. But every January 23rd, we get together. So every guy in the company knows when we're doing this. You know, there is no ifs, ands, or buts. And I think keeping those traditions in the fire service alive are great. And I would love to also say one other thing, because I really, this stuck out to me from Chris before, when he was saying that the first people on the scene go up and do the investigation to find out what's going on, where they're going. I love that because they're taking action not command. And you said they talk to the battalion chief, the chief responding in and tell them what to do. A lot of departments would hogtie the first arriving unit to the lobby to stand there with their feet in cement. And they're there for the entire thing. 
I so agree with your plan where your people take action. Command is the chief's job. Take action, verify, communicate to command. And yeah, that's why I love you, man. <laughs> we have, in fact, it was Jerry, Jerry Tracy, our brother Jerry, that said, these chiefs that want the first arriving company officer to either take command or assume lobby set themselves up for success in terms of incident command. Maybe put them in their comfort zone, but do nothing for the occupants or the firefighters until we find out what the heck we got. Uh, <clears throat> just to clarify, Chris and I come from departments where uh, we may call that box that takes people to the hospital an ambulance. But um, in my case, we call it a rescue because it is equipped with an officer two firefighters, the officer and the firefighter have a um, jump seat with breathing apparatus in it. Yeah, right in the cab, clean cab. And uh, and I'm sure Chris has the same thing. Uh, in his article, he mentioned that they have a hand pump and they obviously have breathing apparatus, forcible entry tools and the like. So um, some departments do not embrace that. We kind of have out of necessity Chris, I'm sure you're in the same situation uh, with that. But uh, Captain Mike, uh, you couldn't have said it more uh, succinctly. And that's why when I get back to work, we have lousy internet at work, so I have to come home uh, to uh, to do this webcast. But Mike, you you nailed it, brother. You nailed it. So. Um, well, I think Chris want... nailed it putting it together, Bill. With Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate it. That's great, man. All right, what about that Canadian? Oh, I'll tell you, we, we, we don't sit and wait in the lobby. We send uh, two crews up because if that first truck or our, our, our company goes to the lobby, that would be equivalent to parking a city block away at a residential house fire and waiting. It, 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 it doesn't make any sense. So we're sending two crews up top. That gives us six lengths of hose. That gives us six... Uh, sorry, 30 stories worth of improvised standpipe off six lengths of hose. The mm -hmm. elevators fail. We're good. That third in truck will take lobby for us. But, you know, we don't park a city block away at a residential house fire, so we, we, we should not do it at high-rise buildings either. Get up there to the fire location, um, not the building address. It's got to be the fire or alarm location. you got to do it. Yeah, yeah so... Music to my ears. It's yeah, our the, eyes and ears that are going to give the incident commander that accurate, um, um, accurate uh, um, incident action plan. Not, you know, just looking at that alarm panel. We have to get up there and tell tell them what we have. Yes, chief, we have smoke. Yes, chief, we have a fire. Yes, chief, we have a dirty hallway. Chief, the stairwells are now contaminated. You you, you have to give them the proper uh, size up, and you can't do that from outside the building. You got to be uh, up top. So yeah, the uh, part of our our tasking for that first uh, company so we set it up so the minimum of two people so any any uh vehicle that shows up uh in our department can do this the whether it be an ambulance uh our little rescue squad or engine or a truck whoever it is the once they get up there and knowing that the host team comes up there we send six people with six lengths of hose up two is our initial we merge the two engine companies uh that recon the, the reconnaissance team that investigation team can then merge up with them and direct them to where they need to go give them the information of what what's the best stairwell to go up uh what where are people are evacuating what where exactly the fire is what's burning um and all that where the standpipe is if the standpipe's broken if the uh, we need to improvise a standpipe so yeah, they can they can relay all that information that they gather in that in that reflex time for that engine to show up the uh and then they're the, for them to gather all their equipment and start heading up and if the elevators are working if they're gonna have to go up you know via stairs or whatnot so they, there's a lot of information then they get they can pass on and uh it's invaluable so by the time the the, uh, the companies get there to know that the uh and, uh, and any of those crews, like any of those crews that go up the biggest thing is smoke control control the doors um yeah. shut the doors close the stairwell door you you got to start that um 
compartmentalization because we see fires that um, we weren't successful at in the past is as soon as that first compartment's lost, the second one gets lost, the third compartment gets lost, the more compartments we lose, the worse. So as soon as those crews get there, get up there and get those compartments um, um, uh, you know, separated because once you start losing compartments, you start losing the building. I call wakening up the building. The more compartments you use, the more people we wake up, the building becomes alive and your problems become uh, worse for you. Captain Mike, theoretically, 2020 hindsight, if every stairwell door and every apartment door at Twin Parks had been closed the way they're supposed to be with self-closers, not wedged open, how many people would have died? That, that's a very tough question, Bill, because the problem is the building is full of a lot of uh, immigrants who do not know construction, do not know the stuff and these people. But closed doors and stairwell doors closed, okay, would have made a huge difference. But I think a lot of people, some people fell and blocked the stairway doors when they went down, opened up the stairway doors. Some of them were bad. But the other thing is the other component to this is education. You know, I know they're pushing it. Close when you doze, close the door, whatever else. I mean, I got pictures of a door from a fatal fire um, where the woman in the apartment next door slept through the entire thing, opened up a door, the hallway was torched. There was nothing left. It all burnt down, wind blown, the whole thing. She opened up the door to go to work at seven o'clock in the morning and we were still there. I know she's like, what the hell happened? And she slept through the whole thing. So I think it's, it's a combination of the closing of the doors and of the education. We have to educate these people. and. We're going through the same thing right now with all of the lithium ion batteries. I saw another fire today that I think is going to be lithium ion related. I don't know, but I think they took 12 people out um, in Brooklyn. And I think one of them was critical, but a lot of these people are charging these um, micro mobility devices at the entrance doors to their apartment. And they're cutting off their only means of egress out of their apartment in these high rise buildings. And we are having a ton of fires. I think last year it was 90 something people that died as a result of uh, battery fires in the New York City area, 90 something. You know, if, if we were losing 90 people a year due to um, other items in the fire service, 90 civilians, they would be shouting from the rafters, what are we doing here? But I, I don't understand it. And I think there's something we have to look at. We have to work at on this. And, and it's the education form. And we are the educators. When um, we talk education, uh, I just got off a plane. But every time I'm on a plane, they educate us on where the exits are. Every time I go on a cruise ship, they educate us where the exits are. Then you get a floating high rise or, or, or you get a, a real high rise building. They give you a pamphlet that you may not be able to read or understand. So where we should be educated when you move in, when you move out, whatever the case may be, in the event of emergency, this is your personal evacuation plan. This is what is expected of the fire department. This is how your building will behave. Um, cause we do it on our planes. We do it on our boats. We should be doing it in our high rise buildings. Absolutely. And very honestly, people should do more. I always tell people I, I fly a lot. So I, I, I get upgraded occasionally, but I also, I, if I'm not upgraded, I take the exit row and people say to me, oh yeah, yeah. I'm in the exit row. I got more leg room. So do you know the three reasons you don't open the door on an airplane? If you're in the exit road, do you know the three reasons? And everybody looks at you and says, there are three reasons? Yes. There are three reasons you don't open the exit door on a plane. Water is outside the door, outside the window. You're not gonna let water in to flood the plane. There's fire outside the window or there's debris outside the window. And if you don't know this and you're sitting in an exit row, you're really not there to do the job. Also, what kind of plane is it? How is the door gonna open? Is it one of the old ones where you have to pull it in or is it the new ones that snap up? Okay, the new ones that snap up, they'll take your arm off if you leave it hanging on to that thing. 
Okay, you got to know what you're doing. You got to pay attention. And you can't depend on just them educating you. You have to educate yourself. And that's why this is so important to all of us. Yeah. We, 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 as far as training people in buildings, we have a good record for training people in office buildings. We have a poor record for training staff in hotels, all right, particularly the staff on the overnight shift. And we have a poor record of training the people in residentials. They make it optional. If, if it's optional, I just dealt with a big city. They don't want to do it. I said, then get in there and train the staff that's working the building. And it'll let me know where people with disability the apartments are. So and everybody said, when you deal with condos and co condominiums, they'll invite you in a lot more. All right. They have a, they have a stake in the game. It's their building. Clark, how do you deal with people in, that are, uh, droves of guests in a hotel that are in a rather uh how shall we say festive mood uh yes so fighting fire in high-rise hotels is different way different than fighting fire in high-rise residential high-rise commercial because one of the reasons cap is what you just said uh, if you're in las vegas 50 percent of people 24 hours a day are under the influence of something in addition uh people are unfamiliar with the building Right. They're there for a couple of days. Very few people actually look at the back of the door and figure out the, the evacuation route. Very few people walk the hall and find out where their stairwells are. Uh, I've, I've run calls on people that are so drunk they have no idea what hotel they're even in or what hotel they're staying in. So this is a huge problem. <clears throat> Fortunately, in Las Vegas, uh, we have very modern buildings with very, very uh, good fire protection systems. But... Um, that, that when you're dealing with the public, when you're dealing with the public, my father used to say, if you deal with people, you earn your money. And that's absolutely true. On paper, our plan works fantastic. It's on paper, it's flawless 100% of the time. Flawless, it works every time because we don't take into effect the human factor. We don't take into effect drunk people uh, getting mad because you, you try to tell someone who's got a baby in his arm and he's carrying his luggage down the hall, I'm sorry, sir, you can't use this stairwell. This is the attack stairwell. You have to go completely to the other side of that hallway, 200 feet, and use that stairwell. What's he say? He says, F you, and he punches you in the face, and he takes the stairway anyway. Happens on a regular basis, regular basis. So <clears throat> you just we have to be prepared. We have to be prepared to deal with the human factor, different levels of inebriation, uh, different levels of aggressiveness, um, different levels of language barriers, all that kind of stuff. So there's, there's no bill. I can't tell you. Here's our policy for dealing with drunk people, uh, but I can tell you we, we are prepared to make accommodations for those individuals. And on on that uh, topic that Captain Dugan was talking about, same thing, the MGM Hotel fire in 1980, they had people that were so drunk, they slept through the whole fire, Mike. Whole fire, multiple people still in the rooms. They went room to room searches after the fire was extinguished and they found people sound asleep in their beds. So... Yeah, it's, it's uh, all bets are off when you're dealing with human beings and then on top of it, inebriated human beings. So you well, better you know, have, better have a plan. Demographics, there are certain cultures where panic is contagious, where people will jump to their death when it's not warranted, when the smoke conditions are not that heavy, just because they don't know what to do. So fight or flight takes in and they end up doing the wrong thing. And the right thing is usually what you just mentioned there, Clark, if you can stay in your unit, but uh, that is the panic is, well, I guess who said panic is good if you're the first one that panics, but other than that, it's, it's no good. It's no good. Well, Bill, when I was studying for lieutenant, there was a WNYF written by somebody, and I'd have to go back and look at it, which is the New York City Fire Department magazine with New York firefighters. Um, and it was about panic. And it was really cool because one of the test questions on one of the tests I took was about panic. And people are more likely to panic at a drama than a comedy. And people are more likely to panic if they're below grade than above grade. So it went into all of these things about panic, how it's contagious and everything else. And it was just so interesting, but I'll never forget. 
people are more likely, and that was the question, more likely to panic at a, a drama than a comedy. Hmm. I like it. One like of the things it. that we, we have to look at is, is human behavior in, in fires. You know, there are a lot of good books out there on that and, and stairwell movement. Anybody know what a stop gap method is every time in the stairwell? Stop gap method. Again, when, they, when they move, they sway. They don't they don't go regimented. Oh, okay. Then there's overtaking. What is every time in a stairwell in a lot of places, stop gap. People stop and whoa. Why are they stopping? No idea. The floor below them, they're coming out and the door opens. Oh. Everyone behind them stops. Now do that, you know, when you're not you don't have control in evacuation. That every time those doors open, there's people stopping. All right. Until they it ain't just the person with, with an injury or disability. None of these stairs are designed for none of these high rises are designed to be fully evacuated. You went 44 to 53, and we still don't have enough. If it was designed to be evacuated, Mike would be the garden, Madison Square Garden with 20-foot corridors and a 20-foot staircase with banisters in the middle, and I get eight doors. I'm dealing with one door at the bottom. <laughs> All right? Yep. Okay. Yep. So uh, it, it's a tough one. And we were all talking fire, but think of the other threats that come along with this. All right? Other threats. And those are different evacuations. Yep. You know, you're dealing with an exterior or an interior event. Right. When do I use, can I use elevators? Whoa. All elevators, all stairs, no elevators. I, I took it down in New York City, Mike. One staircase that directly goes to the street. That's what I'm left with. Because the other one goes into the lobby and the lobby's compromised. Yeah, absolutely. So you, you need to get that human element in there more about stairwells. All right. Photo luminous markings are beautiful. <laughs> all right. Very good. We put them in in 2004. All right, all the lights go out. That green room lights up, and we when we put it together, we put it together that it's illuminated for 24 hours under two candela of the light. So they leave, we get them out, and next number of hours. Now I'm in there, and uh, Mike can tell you on the, on the World Trade Center, the first time that there was nothing there. On the second attack, those staircases were lit up for those who can get out better. Okay, so if there was something there. We put it in the code and people got to pick up on that. Who, uh, uh, clock, I seen them in your stairwells, I think, when I was in the hotel. Photoluminous markings. Uh, what was that? One more time, Jack. The photoluminous markings, the glow sticks. The glow yes. stuff on the marking the stairwells and the yeah. exit paths and the stairwells. Uh, you have them? Masters. Yep. And we also have them low. We have our exit yes. signs down low on the yes, floor as well. Yes, you do. Yes. And they're green. That's the other thing green. Why do you yes. have your exit signs red? What does red indicate to you? Stop. Stop. Hey, hey Captain Mike. Captain Mike, I got your wife on the phone here. Okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> she said, get your ass off the internet and you let go out to dinner. All right. You got it. God boys bless you, girls. brother. God bless All you right. both. Right, have a good one, Mike. See All, right. All right. Take Thanks. care, Mike. Uh, right, let's wrap this up. A big hey, shout Jack, out to uh, Key. That's keyhose.com. We use it every day. If you want to put any piece of equipment to the torture test, have, your, have it in recruit training, and they will use and abuse it, drag it over asphalt, over uh, corners, um, up the stair treads. They'll wear it out over windowsills, and then... Let it lay. Oh, I shouldn't say this because we might violate the warranty. But we let let the stuff lay out there in the tropical heat <laughs> most of the time, uh, with the sun beating down with the UV. Guys, I think we covered a lot. Chris, I think that uh, we touched on a topic that we just scraped the surface of. Yeah. The the suburban fire departments are being tasked with big city problems, but they don't have the big city resources. So That's why until next month, 
Uh, well, happy Valentine's Day to everybody. I know Jimmy, back uh, in the 30s on Clark Street, they had a rather unusual day of us uh, celebrating Thanksgiving Day. Do you know what I'm allude alluding to? I think you're going down the road of the St. Valentine's Massacre. Yeah. Am I close? <laughs> yeah. And, and who, who orchestrated it? Al Capone was sitting in his place in Miami Beach. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. You can take the uh, the tour, the gangster tour. It takes you all these, these cool places. But yeah. <laughs> Uh, we have Valentine's a, Massacre. Yeah, Either Jimmy, we have a we have the Mob Museum in Las Vegas, and this is this is no joke. They mm -hmm. actually bought all the bricks from the wall in the Valentine Massacre. Wow. They numbered them, they brought them to the museum, and they reassembled them in order with all the bullet holes in them. The original wall of the Valentine's Massacre. What the hell is wrong with people? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I I have yeah. none of these issues in Jersey. I just want to let you know that. <laughs> hey, yeah, guys, and, uh, next month. God yeah. bless you. Keep you safe. You guys, take Stay care. God bless you. Be good. Chris, right, guys. before we get off, uh, one of the guys give you my email, okay?